a very great pleasure today. So it's uh, December 5th, um, which is uh, Santa Claus Eve in Bavaria. We're all afraid about the black guy coming and asking us if we have well behaved last year. Um, so uh, today, Kudan Open Lab Seminar Systems Biology meets Cultural Data Analytics. And um, so I have been, uh, this uh, it was a fairly sort of cryptic invitation that um, Pascal Falter Brown, um, Anna Roxane Karvunis, and Jörg Menke got from me. We know each other from Boston, where we encountered in the sort of larger ecocosmos of Barabasi Lab, the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and a bunch of other places, where network science was practiced um, also in the area of systems biology. And um, I, th I, don't, I don't actually know if this is true for all three of you. I think Pascal is a biologist, but uh, Anna Alexandra and, and Dierk, you started as physicists, I think, right? No? You started as biologists too? Nice. Yeah. Yes, okay. So at least Dierk started as a physicist. So the, the interesting thing about this um, um, sort of concoction of people was there's people coming from physics, people coming from different areas of domain expertise. And the area which I perceive to be the most advanced in terms of multidisciplinarity was certainly uh, the systems biology area. And it not only included networks, but it included also all sorts of other things uh, that you encounter if you do multidisciplinary science, like how to deal with large data sets, how to um, um, deal with uh, bias in the data sets, how to talk to each other when one part of your crowd basically writes down equations, runs models, runs numerical models, or quantifies the data, when the other part of the crowd runs algorithms, or in words like, you know, sort of like um, uh, sequencing machines and uh, yeast to hybrid apparatuses that analyze actual real life in vitro. And another part of your group is theoretical, another part of your group draws pictures and so on. And there, in some way, I've learned that it always makes sense to look at systems biology, how they do stuff. Because there is so many more people, there is so much more money to actually get inspiration from. Like if you have a problem with a UMAP plot and there's only a small number of people in the humanities doing that, it always makes sense to look at biology papers because there will basically be hundreds of them and somebody will help solve your problem. And so the motivation for this invitation was to say, okay, let's take two or three not so random people who are really good at that in different ways. Um, and you will see there is not, um, none of your labs is actually called systems biology, but you have a particular flavor of what you're actually doing, but you're basically operating with a, sort of a group of people towards finding out something really interesting. And um, what I hope we can also give to you is like cultural data analytics, in some sense is deeply inspired by this, even though not everybody in this area may be aware of this. Um, there is sort of something where we go, quote unquote, beyond digital humanities, where, for example, we have a physicist in the group, or for example, we aim for multidisciplinary journals, among other things, where we have sort of figures as the main a uh, carrier of the result as opposed to text and the figures are just the quote unquote illustration. And why this makes so much sense, I would like to just put up two pictures, which um, sort of uh, give you a taste of like how big that challenge is. So I assume the biologists in the room know this picture. This is from a, a paper from 2014, which is called From pre womb to Tom. <laughs> so from before birth to death, basically. And it sort of um, summarizes, and it's one way to summarize, there's other versions of this where other things are in there and other things are not in there. Uh, sort of the hierarchy of complex systems that are related to life. And so you can see the exposome, the epigenome, the microbiome, the metabolome, the proteome, the transcriptome, and the genome. That's all stuff that goes on within the body. And then um, on top of that, once you have organisms, you have interactions. One could add cognition here. Um, you have psychology. 
which uh, you know you could say there's a lot of neurons sort of like having then some new quality. And once you get a lot of cognitive agents, you have social interactions. That is again complex, and it's firmly a part of complexity science. Like if you go to the complexity science conference, there will be lots of quantitative social scientists doing that kind of stuff. But then there's something missing, which is cultural products. So artworks, music, texts, like all that kind of stuff, literature also has complex property. But the simplest thing is like there's a sense distribution of word frequency in text, right? Which uh, obviously is not quite random, but there is some structure. And so not only the social interactions are complex, but also our products by themselves. And this is why in our group, people come together who do all sorts of cultural history, um, computational linguistics, creative industry studies that looks at networks and knowledge graphs, maybe uh, people who look at images using machine learning, people who analyze and synthesize, do art with that and so on. But they're all operating with similar complex structures. And that is unfortunately something that has been forgotten. And so this is picture number two. What you see here on the left is sort of the hierarchy of disciplines in the foundational paper, More is Different by Philip Warren Anderson, which sort of describes the hierarchy of complexity where you could say the granular stuff of one field is the quality of another field. Like, you know, the molecules of chemistry together are, you know, result in the new quality of biology. You could say then, you know, lots of cells, lots of organisms together give societies and the social interaction leads to cultural products. And so the key thing is that in Philip Warren Anderson's version and in the XKCD version on the top right, which obviously is inspired by this kind of thing, the cultural products are missing. While the old school complexity science of the Viennese school, which you see to the lower right, Rupert Riedel, uh, who's an evolutionary biologist, he would add that on top left of this hierarchy where he, he does this as a sort of confusion matrix of fields and the kind of stuff that these fields focus on. On the upper right, you find kulturwist, which basically means cultural science in a strict sense, meaning focus on the products on the shape of architecture, on the images, on the pieces of music, on fashion, like all that kind of stuff, which sort of we only have as a testament of social interaction, but not social interaction itself. And so I can leave that for later. That kind of stuff is sort of what we're focusing on. And um, we are very much in the beginning, even though, as you can see, Rupert Riedel does this at least since 50 years also. Um, we can learn a lot, we think, or I think at least, uh, from systems biology because you a, have this going on for a much longer time and there is more money, more people in there and there is different ways of pe how people have enacted that. So what I would love to hear from you is basically just a little introduction for 10 to 15 minutes each of how, what are you doing? And you don't need to sort of refer to cultural analytics, no pressure. Uh, so basically, really just what is the thing you're doing in your circumstance? And uh, then at the end, I will do the same for our cultural data analytics work and feeding into discussion what maybe we can learn from each other and how maybe we can collaborate in the future. That would be a very, very interesting result. So I just unshare my screen and I ask one of you uh, to sort of like... Um, uh, introduce what 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 is what are you doing in your lab and what's your motivation and how does it fall out? And now I need to stop share. So Pascal, do you want to start? I want I want to start. I'm eager to start. Yes. <laughs> I was, so I really like this. I really like the idea of coming from very different fields, learning from each other, exchanging and stuff. Um, and at the same time, I know from experience, and I find myself in the same situation again, that it's a, it's it's difficult to find a start because you don't know what the other side knows, what they are expecting, what their state of mind is and stuff. And so um, I figured I made my life easy and I stuck to um, Max's recommendation of just putting up a couple of slides and, and one kind of little bit of, of a story that we've been working on 
to just illustrate how, how we go about what we're doing and what we're interested in. Um, so I will now share my slide. And if this is like completely beside the point, please feel free to interrupt and I will, you know, just develop my introduction in a, in a dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, probably like some of my fellow speakers, I'm gonna, we are interested in um, interaction networks and, and in, in molecular networks um, that guide, actually, where's the, hang on, I want to just here, so like this. We, we are interested in understanding the molecular networks that basically mediate the transition from, from chemistry to biology, that, that mediate decision-making and that mediate the sustaining of, of life. And we do this by now mostly in the human system, um, but we have been working a lot of, uh, we've been doing a lot of work also um, in a plant system. And I want to illustrate first our basic problem on the human side and then, but then really um, switch and tell you about one story that we've developed in in in, um, in plants, and and one of our focuses is also, and I'm not going to talk about that, how microbial agents are modulating um, are modulating these networks and then contribute to diseases either as infectious diseases or in the long term for something that we perceive as non non infectious disease. So and the basic question is really. Um, you know, what is life? How does life work? And, and in, you know, in the 80s, 10 years after the paper that you just quoted, um, the US basically envisioned and came up with the Human Genome Project. And the idea was that, that we, we basically solve life once we have the genome. And then we have the genome and, and already a few years later, people realized that it's, it's very difficult and, and very difficult to understand. And, and a point of why this was not fulfilling and living up to the promises was that when, when we thought about the genome before we had it, we thought about it as, oh, we get a parts list. We basically get this kind of explosion diagram we can just put together. We know and we understand how everything works. And instead, what turned out is that we get a little, a, really a parts list. And we don't know anything about the connections between these different parts. And as little as a phone book helps us to understand the complex life of a city or a country or you know, anything in the cultural realm, as, as little does a parts list of macromolecules that we find in the genome um, help us understand biology, cells, and you know, life in a, in, a, in a more grandiose way. Um, and, and one reason that that's you know, in, in the cultural and in the security setting, um, people are collecting interactions and collecting data. We are trying basically to do the same thing for biology. So in more specifically, we are interested in understanding how these biochemical networks of components that are encoded in the genome that are subject to genetic variation and that are perturbed by environmental components, especially by living components, how those lead to phenotypic differences, how this contributes to disease and, and infectious disease severity. In order to do that, we first need to map and, and basically know about these networks. And for this, uh, yeah, no, and, and, and in, this, in, this, in this understanding, we're pursuing a very interdisciplinary approach. We do a lot of experimental network mapping and ex systematic experiments. That's, that's a very important part. We do a lot of data integration. And then sometimes ourselves, but very often also through collaborations, we really then dig down and go into the nitty gritty details to understand, understand specific, specific mechanisms using classic biochemistry and genetics and cell biology. Um, the network mapping, we have a pipeline, we do a lot of quality control. And as you said earlier, it's important to do this network mapping in an, in an unbiased way, meaning in a, in a systematic fashion in order to avoid just studying that what has been studied by people for a long time. So there's a lot of history in a lot of different fields. People have been studying infectious diseases and have been studying cancer, especially for 40, 50 years. And so there's a lot of, there's an immense richness of data in there. Um, and other diseases and other, yeah, other diseases have been studied much less. And so 
for us, it is important to, to basically start from scratch and collect a lot of data for all kinds of diseases so that we're not only rediscovering what has been found in infectious biology and cancer biology before, but in order to get really a, an, as much as possible unbiased look at what's going on in these molecular networks. And that's why we, why we basically do this. And, and one example of how we go about this, I want to, I want to um, provide you, and, and this, this is playing out in plants. In plants, we have so-called hormone signaling pathways. There's many different, different hormone pathways, um, and they, are interest, they, they mediate, on the one hand, growth and development, and that tend to be the ones here on the left side, and on the other hand, stress responses to infections and to things like drought stress um, that we have here on the, on the left side. And we know for many years that there's, and there's a lot of genetic evidence for this, that these guys are very, very much coordinated. There's a lot of crosstalk. People, you know, these, these pathways, they talk to each other and it's very difficult to pinpoint where exactly this is going on. Um, and it, we know that it's not taking place on a transcription level, meaning one of these biological layers of regulation. So biochemically, these pathways have all been studied very cleanly. So each of these is basically their own fields and each of these pathways have been looked at in detail and they're very well characterized. But still, when we looked at, at the big picture, there was very little contact between these different pathways. And we figured, okay, this is something that is interesting to look at using our systematic approach. So we did the network mapping and, and we generated this network and this is now only our data. So there's a lot of, lot of colors. Each color corresponds to one of these hormone pathways basically. And you can see that there's a lot of, lot of dispersed signals. So these, these colored spots, they're showing up in, in all kinds of different um, areas of the network. And, and one hypothesis, and this may be similar, or it's actually something that I think comes from social sciences, is that we assume that similar functions are being executed by proteins that are close to each other. They form so-called communities. And so we looked at these communities in our network and we were able to discover these communities and we were able to find a very significant signal of these communities that are annotated with proteins or that contain proteins that function in one particular pathway. So that kind of made sense. We could look at examples here. We have the abscisic acid community and the AJA and ethylene community. But when we further looked, we realized that only about a third of proteins that mediate the signal for a given pathway is organized in these communities. So there seems to be an additional layer of complexity in these, in these networks that goes beyond this community organization. We actually then compared what was known in this, in this more biased classical agglomeration of, of classical studies and our networks. And in particular, we asked about direct contact points between different pathways. And you know, we look, first looked at the distances and we could see that the, the different pathways are fairly far away from each other. Whereas in our systematic map, they seem to be very intermingled. They're very close. Everything is very close to each other. And when we now look at what we call pathway contact points, so we have two proteins and one is annotated to belong to one pathway and the other one is annotated to a different pathway that's illustrated by the colors, we find an immense enrichment, a, a huge abundance of these contact points in, in our network. And so one thing that we always find important is that to not stop at these statistical correlations, but then test these in experiments. And so we did that. We took these 20 something pairs and all of these pairs have some sort of different annotation. So these, the, everything here on the, on the, on the left side um, are proteins, each of these are proteins and they're annotated to different pathways. So this DDL is supposed to only function in, in ethylene signaling and this MIG2 in two different pathways. And so we asked for each of these, can we find a function in this case of MIG2 also in the ethylene signaling pathway? And we did this for all of these. <clears throat> and, but, and so one thing, so, 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 so we have these, these 
five test proteins that, that I'm going to show you now, and 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 each of these is interacting with the protein that is in, that is interact that is functioning in ethylene, and you can see that all of these candidates apparently also function in ethylene signaling, even though this was not known before. And our controls where we pick proteins also from this subset that are not annotated or are not interacting with ethylene signaling, um, they are apparently don't also don't show a phenotype in this. And so we actually had a fairly high validation rate doing this. So 90% of the pairs had at least um, one of the two pairs was at least proteins, uh, was at least um, uh, significant. And for the majority of new proteins, we could also find a new function. What was remarkable though now is when we look at over all of these assays, we did this for many different assays. When we, when we looked at this test set before we did our, our subset, we had a distribution of about two thirds of proteins that were specifically annotated to a single pathway. So EDS to green, DDL to red. And about a quarter to a third of proteins were annotated to function in multiple pathways. After we did our validation at this, this systematic validation and testing, we found that the vast majority is actually functioning in multiple pathways. And so this indicates that perhaps the specificity that we thought about in biological signaling in, 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 this, in this pathway signaling is actually not there. The entire network functions as a whole with many proteins functioning in many, many different pathways. And in that case, a problem with the explosion diagram that I showed at the very beginning is that we don't have an engineering kind of mindset in biological systems, but it's a much more delocalized decision making where the entire network as a whole is responding in one way or the other. And how these biological networks are functioning in their entirety is something that we really don't understand because with our limited set of mind, we've been focusing on this pathway model of biological regulation. And this is something that I found actually very exciting and very thrilling. And um, this was just one example. So this was, this was published two years ago um, in Nature. And, and more recently, we, have, we had a, a study on, on COVID. And here we also found something interesting. Um, and that is that in, in, in um, the, the genes that predispose to severe COVID are actually not direct targets of the virus, but they are in the network neighborhood of direct affected targets, of direct viral, protein, uh, direct virus targets. So what we have here is that the virus targets a specific protein, but it's the network environment that is deciding how this impact is perpetuated into the network and then how this leads, if this leads to a very severe or to a more, more mild course of disease. And this was, was published earlier this year. And, and I'm, I'm trying to just to give you a sense of how we approach and how we sometimes discover a previously unknown complexity by combining different, different types of approaches. And the second paper that I'm quoting here was a lab between, uh, was a collaboration between 10 different labs on, on three different continents. It was very, very interdisciplinary, as you pointed out before. And so with that, um, this is all done by a very fantastic team of collaborators and, and colleagues at the Institute, um, many different um, collaborators in basically in the world. And um, yeah, so that's how we go about addressing this and um, how we go about our research. Super nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. So <clears throat> I, I, I would like to just like, before we go on, mention that um, this was not, all, not only super fitting in terms of content, there is like some really um, sort of straightforward connections. And um, let me just do the second to next slide, which I had in my, um, in, my, um, in my presentation for later. Let me just show this right now, um, just for one second. Um, because what you, while you're looking for a slide, I wanna point out one thing because I'm in parallel at a, an event where I need to give a talk right after we're done here and actually yes. a little bit before that. So I need to sneak out um, a little bit earlier than, than our finish line. So I apologize for that in advance. Yeah, no worries, no worries. 
So let, let me not show it right now. Let, let me just say what it is. So on the upper right in the last slide, you had a matrix, which was um, basically the expression of some genes and some phenotypes as columns and the lines. So there will be a picture which will basically be very, very similar uh, in terms, maybe also in terms of distribution of values, which in our case is paintings and the actual sort of compression values of different transformations of the images, which you could say is sort of the expression of particular ways how to look at the image. And so this is one bridge that we basically talk the same language and tools. The other thing is that a lot of these topics are related, like what you just told us is that in biology, there is sort of many, many constituent parts are basically sort of multivalent and uh, do multiple things. That is also true if you look at academia itself, right? Like we are in the humanities, all super, super specialists. People are supposedly professor for painting in Florentine um, palaces from 18, 1470 to 1495. That's like literally how positions are written out, even though everything is sort of more connected and actually should be studied in a more systematic way. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will just maybe go on to Andrew Sander, so we actually can have Pascal in the discussion at the end also, I guess. Thank you very much. Stage is yours. Can you see? Yes. Great. Well, thank you. I like Pascal. I'm quite excited and curious about this event. And in a way, the last thing that Pascal said is a little bit the starting point of my entire research program. Cells probably have not been engineered by anyone. So I think cells like machine, are not like machines. And the reason why is that machines are not alive. And how we can know that is that machines do not evolve. My, the main you know, thrust of my research program is to understand the mechanisms of change and innovation in the evolution of biological systems. How do we have systems that work perfectly fine so an organism that is alive and reproduces, change over time to better adapt or disappear. This intrinsically invo involves a certain plasticity, a certain delocalization, like Pascal said, and these phenomena are just not understood at all today. So that's what, that's what I study. The, um, Evolutionary theory tells us that the diversity of life, the changes that we see over the millennia, come from the process of descent with modification. A long, long time ago, there was a early life, and from it, generation after generation, change accumulates, and the descendants of the ancestor have small differences that can lead to large differences, that can lead to the creation of entirely novel species with entirely novel shapes, sizes, properties, and behaviors, and, and, and niches in the environment. How does that happen? At the molecular level, we think that the evolution of species is driven by the evolution of genes in the, in the genomes of organisms. And we think mostly that the molecular innovation comes from changes in genes, generation after generation. So this ancestral species or group of species in early life had a set of genes, the ancestral genes, that generation after generation accumulate changes, substitutions that change them a little bit or a lot, they can also undergo larger changes, like duplicate themselves, merge with each other, even jump from one species to the next, 
through the process of cross-species transfer. Overall, they follow a trajectory that accompanies and drives the trajectory of the organisms that contain the genes. And these trajectories are different in different lineages, leading to different phylogenetic groups, species, and organisms. When we think about this process, and now we think of the genes like parts, like Pascal talked about, it results that we can group most genes into what we call gene families represented on the left here. We can analyze the sequences and properties of genes across the entire tree of life from viruses, bacteria, humans, insects, plants, and find those that kind of look like each other. We can make groups of them. They resemble each other within and across species. We call this a gene family, and there are hundreds of gene families across the tree of life. But it does not encompass the entire genetic potential of organisms. And there is another class of genes that, in contrast to gene families, we call them orphan genes. Orphans because they don't have a family. They resemble no other gene. They are unique. They are usually found in only one species or closely related group of species. These orphan genes, for instance, would be found in the genome of human, but not chimpanzee, or apes, but not other mammals. They are rather exciting components of the genome because they may underlie what makes each species unique, what makes humans humans, what makes yeast yeast, etc. And that's a very fundamental question that. I find uh, very exciting. So I've been studying a lot, what are the evolutionary origins of these orphan genes? And roughly the summary of my studies that the rest of the field sort of agrees with is that some of these orphan genes have in fact simply lost their families. So from an ancestral genes, they have accumulated so many changes over time. They have diverged from where they came from so much that we cannot recognize them anymore. Yet they have a family, they are just astray. However, the majority of the orphan genes seem to in fact have originated from scratch, which is something that was thought to be impossible uh, only 10, 15 years ago. They truly do not have a family because they actually do not derive from a gene existing in the ancestor. These are cases, we call them de novo gene birth, whereby an entirely novel gene arises in the evolution of an organism from a piece of DNA that was not a gene in the past. That's a radical fundamental transformation of genetic information from one state, which is a state of silence that does not participate in the biology and is a bit dead weight in the genome to becoming a novel, functional and important gene that is intrinsically part of the, of the essence of an organism. So that's crazy. That's what I study the most. And in this context um, with colleagues, uh, we have developed a way to think about how that could be possible. How do you come from nothing to something? and developed this model shown in this slide called the protogene model for de novo gene birth, which basically calls upon the presence of intermediate states between nothing and something. There is the proto something, we call them the protogenes. Uh, so these would, these would be transitory elements that can appear 
but they are not quite genes yet. They are transitory, meaning they can disappear really rapidly as well. And occasionally they can call upon selection, provide a bit of, an, of a selective advantage and grow and become new genes in, uh, along with the development of species. The, that's a rather molecular model, but one that I hope uh, can have interesting connotations for also the parallel with cultural analysis, I don't know, in the sense that uh, just a few years ago, if we take the model organisms Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is a baker's yeast, it, it used to make wine and bread and beer, that organism so, was thought to have about 5,000 genes. But now that we've been thinking about the potential existence of such protogenes, we found um, 18,000 of them. So there is the image here shows you in red the a schema of a, of a gene. And there's you know, 5,363 of them that are known to encode this simple organism. And until recently, that's all we thought there was. And we thought these 5,000 elements made you know, this organism alive. But now that conceptually we've reasoned that there could be more, we have found you know, four times more additional elements in the genome. They are very small. They are dispersed throughout the genome. They are very small. They all have these unique sequences that are only found either in this species of yeast or in just closely related species of yeast, but not beyond. And they are evolutionarily transient, meaning that when we look at them, we can see that they appear and disappear really, really rapidly. In other words, the genome expresses unique elements, a very large number of, of unique elements um, that just changes all the time in addition to the core genes that derive from the ancestral species. So yeah, so that's also crazy. And so we ask a lot of questions about this. And I saw the one that could be the most relevant to you today is this question of how do these protogenes integrate cellular networks? Uh, like Pascal greatly introduced, the cell itself is a system. It is made of a network of intrinsically interacting components. Another way to represent this is shown here. Is this shape represents a yeast cell uh, because yeast have like a little bud um, here. And this network of the cell really uh, reads and interprets genetic information, includes that is in genes and protogenes, the DNA information, which changes over time, is expressed into proteins that may fold into structures. This is controlled by networks to decide or, and, and constrain how they fold or whether they should just be degraded. They can be targeted, put into subcellular organelles, localized very specifically or diffusely. They interact in a localized manner with certain other components of the cells or not. And through these interactions, participate in the phenotypes of the cell, meaning what the cell can and cannot do. And this in turn influences the fitness of the organism, either in a good way or in a bad way. And the fitness is basically how many uh, descendants an organism can have. So when the expression of a gene through all these processes leads to more descendants, the process of natural selection will lead to this gene becoming more established in the population. But, so, but often this is not the case. The gene or variants of the gene leads to either less or just no change and then the gene does not get established. So the interaction with the environment and with the cellular and extracellular interaction is what drives whether a newcomer, a new protogen that nature has never seen before, will or will not 
integrate into the new, into the pre-existing system. And we really don't understand at all how that could work. Does the ancestral system welcome or combat this new, these newcomers? We don't know. Does the ancestral system constrain and direct the evolution of a protogen? Or is it vice versa, where the newcomer reshapes the system and changes it? How fast is the turnover of the protogenes? How every how many generations will a population have an entirely different set of protogenes than its ancestors is? How often is the integration of a new element successful here to stay? And how can we tell what may be the implication of this process of gene birth and molecular innovation for biomedicine? If Max and I have different protogenes, does it mean potentially the same drugs are not going to work? If the mouse has different protogenes, may they interact with our understanding of disease in a manner that is species specific and therefore just not applicable to medicine? So many questions. And can we control it in the lab and beyond? I hope one day. <laughs> uh, so a lot of questions and to and, and even more questions, more molecular, are also not shown on this slide. Just wanted to introduce you to these questions that I find very exciting. And uh, just like Pascal, uh, we also had tried to address these questions using an interdisciplinary approach, using data integration, robots for facilitating large-scale systematic experiments, but also um, more small scale hypothesis testing experiment. We are, uh, and this is great, able to do a lot of mutagenesis where we experimentally perturb the genome to see what happens or watch it evolve. And because the question of gene birth is really intrinsically tied with the question of emergence, um, and it's a completely new field of systems biology, we also you know, collaborate with uh, philosophers and rhetor rhetoric scholars a little bit to try to make sense of it even in our head and understand the concepts that we are studying. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. And I hope the conversation uh, was, was fun for you. Yes, su su super nice. Thank you very much. So there is, I, maybe I, I also do sort of like a 20 second sort of bridge, I try at least. So in cultural studies in general, it's cultural research, cultural data analytics, cultural realmics, whatever you want to call it. So one of the largest streams of uh, people that is operating in this area focuses on cultural evolution. And mm -hmm. for those in the group who know that, um, they may be surprised for all of the stuff you have said, there's a lot of things which are not part of that discussion. What I like a lot, um, which I sort of um, you know, confirms my suspicion, so to speak, is you focus a lot on the kinematics of the system, like there's stuff fluctuating in and out of, of, of um, existence, which is not exactly the effect of dynamics, meaning from X follows Y or from inheritance or something. It may lead up to that. But there is some other stuff happening. And so this is very much like as a sort of um, old school studied archaeologist and, and, and art historian, maybe foremost, uh, who looked at a lot of images. That's like my suspicion. There is this kind of thing. Yes, there is renaissance that happened at some point, you know, around 1500. But at some point, people realized, OK, we want to sort of rebirth classical antiquity. But before that, we had a lot of quote unquote protogenes like spolia, um, sculptures that looked that way, whatever. So there's the, the, the whole idea set was there. So in some sense, you could say uh, nothing comes out of nothing, which is also something that goes back to Lucretius, right? So this is like older than the idea of evolution. But at the same time, there is this like really new thing coming up 
which then we call Renaissance. And so the question is like, in how much is cultural evolution um, rooted in similar sense? And what you just said is really interesting because in some sense, there is other mechanisms that could lead to innovation other than the one thing that people study most, which is recombination, adjacent possible, and like all that kind of stuff. So there may be something else, which is sort of like taking parts that are a little smaller. So, so I'm very, very fascinating. Thank you very much. Actually, I want to, if I may, you can even, you don't have to go back all the way to Renaissance, right? You can, you can start with Twitter and look at ideas that are being voiced there and mm -hmm. memes that either go viral and perpetuate through the population yeah. or that, that are just being mentioned once and nobody takes notice. And, and this depends very much on the environment, on the, on the overall environment, on the setting. And I think there's a lot of, lot of similarity to the idea of a protogene either you know, taking hold or, or a meme, an idea, doing this in a, in a social setting. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, let's continue with Jörg and have the big discussion at the end. Um, stage is yours. This is so in incredibly cool. Like I'm, I'm afraid I will introduce you to a lab that will soon need to be dissolved because I have to move to Pittsburgh to become a postdoc in uh, <laughs> Andrew Xander's group. This is in in incredibly cool stuff. Okay, so, you know, for the little while that this lab will still exist, we are working on <laughs> network medicine that we started um, when, you know, Max and, and Alexandra and I met in, in Boston. So this is the, the beautiful object that we study is, of course, also, again, a network. And here, this is a video we made, yeah, back, back in the day in, in Boston, and it shows that if you look at the distribution of disease associated nodes in this protein interaction network, they are not random, but they follow certain patterns. And since then, my group and I have tried to, well, make sense of it in a very broad fashion. So what patterns can be connected to function? What patterns can be connected to dysfunction? And how can you use this to understand or to, to tackle a, a whole array of different um, questions in, in biomedicine. I am, you know, my team is in, incredibly diverse. I have everything from, I'm a physicist myself, as Max said, we have mathematicians, biologists, but we also have a bunch of artists, architects. So it's, it's really a, a very, very diverse crowd. And yeah, what that entails and the communication and the different expectations, the different base models that one has, the different career models, even it's a it's a buzzing beehive. It's interesting, but it's also um, challenging. So for this, you know, super basic introduction, I thought I would just go through the most, um, the, the metaphors that we've been using over the last yeah, 10 years by now almost, that have guided really a lot of our thinking and yeah, I apologize for the network people among you. That is really old news, but it's a. I followed Max's suggestion to repurpose old slides, and here they are. You know, you've seen them a thousand <laughs> times, I imagine. So the basic metaphor is that we 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 try to think of these molecular networks as as maps, and this metaphor has, I'd say, four major components. The first one is that the global shape, there is such a thing as a global shape. So even if you can't read exactly what this map is on the left, I'm sure that you know most of you will have recognized by this iconic shape that this is of course Manhattan. And one can also think of the shape of networks. So an important or perhaps the key study that really started the field of complex network research was the realization that you can characterize the global shape through what we would call a degree distribution and that we can understand how this shape arises. So in a biological setting, or actually very generally speaking, um, we recognize that networks can have different shapes and that vary again, generically, this shape is related to the processes that through which this network has arise. And we have some sense of at least of, of a few of the structural features of these complicated networks of how they um, are determined of how they grow both in biology and but also beyond 
the second part of this metaphor is that location is important. And I looked that up. There is a Starbucks on Times Square and one on Roosevelt Island, except, you know, the one on Times Square arguably sells a lot more coffee than the one on this little location. So centrality is a proxy for importance, both in a city, but also in um, biological networks. And in biological networks is very, again, general. So whether you call a protein important because it is, it, um, it's an essential gene or whether it is particularly prone to um, cancer, cancer associated mutations or um, genes in which mutations cause severe hereditary diseases, genes that are expressed very early in life, what, pretty much whatever measure of importance you can come up with, you will find a relationship between um, it being rather well connected and at the center of these molecular networks, whereas those that are somewhat more redundant would be located more at the periphery. And this is yeah, one uh, an, an early super classic example again from yeast um, that was one of the first systematic studies showing that indeed the, the fitness of these poor yeast colonies that um, have gotten one gene removed is related to how central these genes are in um, this protein interaction network. Neighborhoods are important. So the ones that I highlighted here are Wall Street, um, which arguably is frequented by a different breed of people and serves a different function than let's say Williamsburg, where you know people have beards and um, drink craft beer. And the same can be said about these molecular interaction network. Pascal said it nicely that these communities can be defined and very generally speaking associated to biological function, but to, well, with different details also to biological dysfunction. So whether you look at genes that are known to perform some common action together, or whether you're looking at genes whose collective perturbation results in a, in a disease phenotype, you would typically find them located in, in some sort of, um, of neighborhood. And this is a, yeah, a beautiful, again, it's not quite the same network. These are genetic interactions, but the, the visual impression is so clear cut that these different um, yeah, local aggregations correspond to different functions that these genes within a particular neighborhood perform collectively. And then the last part that also distance matters, and I think, you know, I'm not a cultural data scientist or a sociologist, but I think it's no coincidence that the poorest and most crime-ridden neighborhood in uh, on Manhattan is maximally removed from where the rich people reside. And the same can be said also for these protein interaction networks where diseases, where the relationships between diseases are stronger or less strong depending on the distance between or the overlap between their respective neighborhoods. And this is, again, just a, a visualization of a result of um, that is what I actually was doing in my postdoc back in the day in Boston. Now, with these very simple you know, metaphors, you can do a lot of things. And these are just a few recent examples of, of what we have been working on. So we have been trying to understand better what would be the combined effect between drugs. We have been trying to derive diagnostic tools for rare disease um, gene defects. We try to more systematically evaluate what is the, the actual cellular impact of individual genetic lesions. And, but I think I have more slides on that. We also try to think, how can you take these nice, you know, visual stories that these introductory slides tell and actually convert them to a data analysis platform. I think I have a slide on that. Right, so here's a, a bit more just buzzwords on what are all the things that my group is doing. It's really, we are, sometimes I wanna say we are a bit stretched thin because we do so many quite different things ranging from rather mathematical work on yeah, fundaments of, of how our real world data set distributed in high dimensional spaces to quite medical applications of, of really elucidating the concrete mechanism of action of a particular pathogenic mutation in individual patients to quite mm, yeah, more artistic 
ventures um, such as this. So if tasked of what the, the future of data analysis looks like, I'm quite convinced that it looks something like this. So this is a little video that we made at some point. This is Chris Hütter. She's a, an architect and she's exploring different ways to well, visualize these complex data. And this was one application that we built specifically for um, rare disease gene prioritization. But we think that an, an immersive hmm, data exploration that is really close to, well, the, the, the cognitive environment in which we all grow up, right? Like we are, the way we think, the way we memorize things, the way we interact with each other is very much shaped by a 3D space and i think there is some magic to it that we 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 are only beginning to um uh, to to tap into actually and also from a from a practical perspective it's nice that it allows us to well tap into an entire different area of people and of um, cultural production i guess so these are some examples of or some pictures of um, VR exhibitions that we organized on the right is a picture where they forced me to comment on a on an artwork at the Ars Electronica um, festival. So it's an yet another very interesting universe with very interesting people and experiences that, well, I I never quite had in that intensity in our more scientific um, research directions. And I think. That's already it. This is my bunch of people again, who actually do all the work. I just, um, I'm just hanging out on Zoom these days. Actually, today, no, I'm not. Well, I'm also on Zoom, but I am in uh, Obergurgel, which is a strange place in the middle of the mountains because I'm on a faculty retreat of my um, previous institute, and while everybody else is skiing and breaking their legs, I am here in peace and I think in a in a more fruitful discussion with you which is really great so really thanks for, for inviting me I'm looking forward to it thanks thank you very much <clears throat> I'm doubly envious I totally would love to go ski right after this <laughs> yeah I thanks. might do it tomorrow though you know my my old body I'm not sure if it can still do this I'll see yes. okay yeah, thank you very much. So this was, um, and as you will see, our group here in uh, in Tallinn is in some sense very similar to this last example. So we do a really broad variety of things. And I want to give you also a little overview uh, regarding this. Um, we usually don't do this in these kind of lab encounters during uh, this open lab seminar, because otherwise we would be too repetitive if we do it every Monday. But we haven't done it in a while, so I do it. And uh, so basically, um, I got to do it two ways. And so, I, as I said before, we're, we're operating in this sphere, like one layer up, sort of from the usual hierarchy of complexity science, adding uh, sort of a focus on cultural products. And um, just as a little intro, like where is the overlap with what we have seen? So we very clearly work with complex networks. Here is a. Um, not quite a random uh, example of monument documentation. Uh, this is, I think, um, archaeologists citing the works of Johann Joachim Winkelmann. Um, so there could be many examples like this. Whenever there is a sort of citation relationship, we find complex networks. Um, here you see um, the life uh, or biography of Piet Mondrian. Every column is a painting and every line is sort of the file size after or the file size compression ratio after compression of a particular transformation so every line is something like blur contour um, black and white transformation a Fourier transform or something like that and you can very clearly see the onset of when Mondrian start to look like Mondrian and they're realistic before but you can also see all the qualitative stuff. So there is uh, certain cells that are sort of correlating over time, like in subsets of this. So one can also sort of like theoretically like look in and it's like, oh, what is that where the blur is similar or something like that. So one can do qualitative art history and quantitative art history. So another thing we have in common with a lot of biology studies, Jörg just mentioned it, you try to see how your a uh, real data set is sort of like distributed in multidimensional spaces. 
that's also something you do. What you just saw was one way of doing this. Another way would be the classic sort of let's uh, just embed images with machine learning using resonativity or something like that. Um, and then once you have it in multiple dimensions, what people, people usually do is uh, basically put it again into some lower dimensional space. So here you have a U map of 65,000 artworks. Um, in this case, based on this compression thing, and you can see it really works. So the similar paintings are close to each other. And by the way, I want to point this out. There's a slight disadvantage over doing the same thing with proteins. Here, every dot is the dominant color of the painting. And as you zoom in, you can actually look at the painting. So that is sort of something which um, I always saw as an asset in sort of doing this kind of quantitative art history. Um, it's also over literature studies. I can look at 50 paintings in but one glimpse and see what's the exception, which is rather hard with a lot of novels or say with a lot of folded proxies. And then there is another thing which is obviously there. Um, cultural history, art history, uh, cultural studies in general is stuff that folds out over time. And there very clearly we can see, again, there is complex quality, new quality emerging from granular interaction. So here every dot is sort of the number of pictures shot by tourists in Rome, 250,000 photographs over 10 years in Flickr. And you can see they nicely sum up to the human activity curve. And if you zoom into certain locations, you will find systematic deviations. Like, you know, the blue thing is people want to take pictures of the Fontana di Trevi in the evening because they think of Dolce Vita and Anita Ekberg. And they are hysterically taking pictures at the Vatican museums before the museum closes. So that kind of stuff is sort of things where a systematic perspective makes a lot of sense. So uh, networks, um, we can look at it as matrices or also continuous embedding spaces, which again, raise the same kind of tools and methods. And then we have stuff going on over time. So basically there's a very similar concoction going on uh, that lends itself to sort of use similar methods. When we started the Kudam project, so the Kudam project was actually initiated by a bunch of faculty at Tallinn University who applied uh, to the European Commission for a so-called era chair um, funding, which is 2.5 million euros, so basically equivalent to a consolidator grant with the difference that it's not the sort of PI that sort of applies for the funding, but the university applies for the funding and then sort of finds the so-called era chairs. It's like a chair professorship uh, with a group over a determined amount of time. In our case, because we start late, it's not five years. We're now going from June 2020 to August 24th. It's a rather stiff timeline to A, spend the money and B, sustain ourselves and actually get to results. So we all started synchronously and we're now at a point in time where there's a lot of stuff going to conferences, first papers are out and they're basically working uh, the usual kind of, um, uh, you know, tediousness, you uh, go to a journal and then you find the reviewer that doesn't like it and then you go to another journal. And stuff like that. So um, let me give you a little overview here. So I started this thing um, by trying to hire a group with this picture. So I posted this on Twitter. This is a different version of what I just said. Um, so basically the idea, if you open the hood in IBM Watson, the Jeopardy version, you will find they do some image embedding. So this is the top row, um, neural networks to process images, could be music, audio visual content and stuff like that. And you get these sort of expression matrices, which again, you can study over time. In the middle realm, text, you pick up to topic models, classify them in some other ways. If you want to have the most radical constriction of a text, it's library classification. The whole book is just sort of classified with a bunch of words. So you get a bipartite network. So this is other thing, bipartite networks uh, of classifications, which again, you get these morphous spaces of topics that are related to each other, which one could, could study, watch in the same way as we study morphous spaces in biology. And then the third way of doing this is knowledge graphs. So cultural data is full of relational structured data sets, which we can loosely understand as networks with multiple node and link types. And of course, we can do multi-layer, multiplex temporal network science on that. Now, one thing that happened in the last sort of 10 years is since we all were in network science, is there is an increasing amount of work where information is embedded into multidimensional vector spaces, which are continuous. And that all happens for all these three things. 
And there we can snarkily maybe, but maybe not so snarkily, ask ourselves what's the kinematics and sort of fluid dynamics of these spaces as the system folds out over time. And so these are sort of like the core mechanisms. And of course, we need to stay realistic because we're in sort of, in our case, three particular university schools, the school Baltic Film Media and Arts School, the School of Humanities and the School of Digital Technology, which obviously are more used to actually talk about concrete substance, such as texts, images, film, and so on. And we all have concrete disciplines. Um, and you cannot just, as an art historian, say, hey, I want to study the pure mathematical meaning space that emerges from the vector embedding of 50,000 artworks. Like people already said no to this in 1929, and they continue to do so. So if we want to do it, we basically have to package it in some other way. And so basically, nevertheless, as I put this picture out, um, uh, maybe due to the picture, maybe not due to the picture at all, maybe just due to the word cultural data analytics, maybe because the university was for other uh, reasons attractive, uh, the following people answered the call and were successful um, going over our peer evaluation. And so um, we have this picture is not quite up to date. We have a new project coordinator, Sandra Kalima, uh, where we're in the process of having a picture taken, which she will replace Marlies on top right. Um, and then we have six postdocs. Uh, and six PhD students. Actually, one of the postdocs uh, recently left us, but I never less mentioned it here. Uh, so Anders Karius uh, is a computational linguist. Xenia Mokina is a computer scientist in machine learning with geosocial urban um, uh, visual embeddings. Um, loosely speaking, doing computational social science. Mila Oiva is a cultural historian doing very uh, multidisciplinary work on historical newsreel and sorry, history. The unit Semaltite is working on cultural industry data, particularly the film industry, both historic and currently going on at large scale. Mikhail Tam is a physicist doing sort of what could be called social physics, um, both classically, more classically, one could say, uh, urban um, scaling, urban dynamics questions, but also helping us with this multidimensional embedding spaces, which obviously we have a very big problem that nobody can imagine this properly, how it's fold out and how does it, um, what's the structure and so on. How should we imagine these? The next one is Tasvir Ahmad, uh, who is a specialist in computer vision, particularly this one shot, like you look at an image and you want to recognize the objects. Um, he left us for family reason, but there is a paper coming out. Yana Sachi is, um, um, started as human computer interaction, uh, humanities um, PhD student. Uh, now he's like, um, he's fittingly now at MIT Media Lab for a couple of months because that's sort of probably most uh, poignantly describing the way he works. So he brings all these things together. He works on self representation in, um, in dating platforms and uh, properties of NFT artworks and stuff like that. Mark Connett is an artist uh, together with his wife, actually quite well known, Var and Mar, uh, doing machine learning art. And his PhD work is on latent space navigation. Um, in, so basically, how can we make sense of these latent multidimensional spaces where images are embedded not, and other music are embedded, not only in terms of like how can we analyze it, but also how can it be used meaningfully for synthesis of artworks, both again, visual but also in 3D, like how do you actually sort of do this in play, for example, or with a large robot? You tell the robot a story, the robot draws a picture. Like how does that pan out sort of, and again, you produce something that can be analyzed as cultural analytics. Hannah Yemmer is a, a media policy studies um, a scholar. She uh, basically asks uh, the classic interview question uh, to uh, legacy media institutions, such as newspapers, like how do you use data, which is obviously also fundamentally important for all of us, uh, because obviously we want to not just like look at data sets, but also want to understand how they are actually used. Um, Mark Metz is doing, uh, he's a semiotician originally, and he became more qualitative, quantitative, and now doing sort of like tackling a question which is semiotics driven, how to, um, uh, how does the cultural other work, like people conceptualizing people that are outside of their own group? Um, and there, an interesting question is mainstream media versus uh, right-wing media in Estonia, which he tackles 
with uh, natural language processing. And I always should mention whenever I say X does Y, that there is typically a larger number or a smaller number of the others involved as co-authors. And there is also external so affiliated projects, like we have additional faculty, which is involved, like the initiating faculty, Indrek Ibrus, Marek Tam, Kalpata, Siri Wilkos, and so they're, they're sort of like integrated in that. So there's projects folding out there. He's currently, Mark is currently at Peter Dodd's group in Vermont for a couple of months. So there is again sort of the idea to sort of like really uh, um, nurture this kind of like multidisciplinary interaction. Tilman Ohm is an artist uh, who built a machine who wrote his diploma thesis. And now he's focusing on um, sort of how to imagine, how to image these multidimensional sp uh, spaces that are um, involved in that, how to sort of like interact with them. So he's building a collection space navigator. And he also has a focus on algorithmic creation. So you will see slides in a second. So I'll give you an impression of the figures. I just want to go through the people first. And the last one is Antonina Koripanova, who is also a PhD student, uh, originally uh, in uh, sort of trying to conceptualize a 21st century art school. Um, Antonina's background, she's an artist, a painter, very sophisticated cell. And um, now she also has started um, in a class project um, analyzing museum data, where um, scraping data from the web became a little bit too addictive. And this has now become a really cool paper where we will learn a lot about like the uh, collecting acquisition strategies of museums, which um, I find pretty fascinating. So the key thing, um, that project is a really good example uh, of how the sort of embedding in such a multidisciplinary group can actually lead to sort of like from one thing to another, um, to a larger collaboration. And again, in this particular case, obviously there are several co-authors involved and uh, nothing that we sort of produce at the end will be understandable without uh, sort of understanding sort of like that there is multiple people. In there. And in order to not steal too much time, I will just quickly go through sort of like sample figures um, so you get an impression of what we're doing in this direction. So this is um, um, product board networks in the film industry and uh, sort of gender balance networks and uh, production of historical newsreel. This is with, uh, uh, work by the units in my at et al. And so there's like, I really don't do it justice by just writing one name, but there's a whole bunch of people. The lower line is actually also um, part uh, of a larger collaboration, which here you see all the names um, of these people that I've mentioned before, plus people who are sort of outside. This is sort of a larger uh, collaboration called the Historical Newsreel Project, which also has an additional external funding. And there the idea is to look at like Soviet newsreels and Estonian newsreels over historical time ranges. And this slide is to exemplify a qualitative aspect where this collection space explorer is used uh, for, in this particular case, Mila Oiva, who's leading that particular project uh, to basically analyze sort of these news, both qualitatively and quantitatively, bringing together all aspects of the group. Uh, here you see a machine learning pipeline to sort of recognize optics and difficult images. There, one doesn't need many explanations, but we want to have that. We have lots of images and we want to recognize objects. And paintings are certainly difficult. So this is work by Taswir um, Ahmad. Uh, um, here you see example uh, figures from uh, Yana Sachi, this gender distribution in Tinder on the right. And um, so there's the fact that um, only very small amount of um, properties in the crypto apes sort of determine the price. And so, you know, it, just the whole sentence, how I said this, is a very non-humanistic sentence, but a very, like, this is a sentence you could write in a systems biology paper, just replace NFTs with something different. And this is like, you know, this is a dream figure to get at, to say, you know, look, this correlates with this a lot. Basically, with the matrix as sort of like the evidence. Um, this is a, a sort of a cornucopia of or a collection of um, examples by Andres Karius. And this gives you all the neat impression of the scale of the project. So, uh, all these things are sort of dealing with uh, evolution and change over time. Uh, film festivals, where we uh, look at the data set behind the Cannes Film Festival. On the left, you see uh, evolution of art that's from the same paper that uh, UNED was off, then um, polarization in Twitter, 
And at the bottom, you see programming changes over time in the Estonian national television. If we look at the whole program data set at basically minute resolution over 10 years. This is uh, the polarization work by uh, Mark Metz, also with Andres. Um, this is uh, another work where we look at Instagram pictures in museums. So we have hundreds of thousands of uh, images taken at uh, different museums. Uh, over time and uh, uploaded to Instagram. And here you see 12 profiles, daily profiles of museums over the years. Um, obviously, you can see the effect of COVID. So the museums sort of like um, have a much uh, lower sort of um, footprint of how many people look at that. But you can see there's very clearly this kind of human activity curve, which looks like a sinoid. Fun fact, uh, people don't seem to go for lunch in, when they're in the museum because it closed early. Uh, on top, you also see how we can recognize events. And so I, I want to make clear that there is no museum data involved. So this is data from Instagram, and you can still see where the interesting stuff happens, basically. Um, here you see a similar topic, museums, but then a completely different time scale. So this is when do museums buy artworks? Um, and so on the left, you see the, the orange curves show you when artists produce their work. So between 35 and 40 in essence. And on the right, you see when particular museum buy these artworks. And, uh, you know, there's pretty neat museums like NMK, Kiasma, which uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of have a low lag. But then if you wait in your lifetime to be bought by the Centre Change Pompidou, good luck because the gap is 50 years, five zero. And so, you know, that's like uh, not exactly what, um, you know, it, this stretches the meaning of the word contemporary, I would say. And to the lower right, this is a sort of similar, it's a different version of the same data. And you can see every one of these sort of matrix plots gives you a, a, a characterization of how these museums roll out. And there's a lot of detail. Um, so what, what strikes us a lot is that they all look different. And we have not fully interpreted them, but there is definitely a lot of things going on. And this is what we think is exciting. And again, this is something which probably is left to be found in, this, in, in, in an art history or a humanities institute. But this is the kind of thing like sitting in front of 12 figures like this is sort of something which strikes me as more familiar uh, from like watching my dear colleagues in biology and Boston. Yes, uh, this is uh, Tilman Ulm's work. And here to the right, you can see the attempt to uh, visualize uh, high dimensional space in six dimensions. On the upper left, you see a browsing interface where we use sort of something like UMAPTC as, as a topography. This is similar to Yerk's 3D thing. And then we have other user interface elements that sort of allow us to sort of like uh, select into particular dimensions or even scroll across other dimensions. So you look at a map, say of PC1, PC2, and then you scroll to PC3 and you can actually see sort of like uh, kinematics unfold, sinks and wells and stuff like that. So this is super, super exciting. And then one last thing he does recently is, is looking at neighborhoods. Um, and there again, this is a user interface problem, right? Like if you look at a high dimensional space, you have a point, how do you look at the neighborhood? This is sort of something that is not quite easy. Yes, this is work by Mikhail Tam. So you see over and under expression of locations in historical newsreel. And in the bottom right, you see, for example, the a decorrelation of sort of some uh, multidimensional embedding by sort of like um, squeezing particular uh, dimensions, which leads to a much clearer picture. And you see on the right, this looks much more clustered, same data, rescaled space, basically. Um, yeah, so this is it. Um, here is one in Louis, because you've seen the people. Um, I show you where we are. Uh, so we're at the red dot. We're 10 minutes walk from the port to Helsinki. Uh, with 40 minutes walk north is the, is the airport. To the right, you find the medieval city of Tallinn. And to the left, the most important thing in 10 minutes, you're at the beach. <laughs> so that is sort of what we're doing. And um, so I hope this was also not too much of a time. Um, so the idea is, um, as you can see, this is many, many different things. And there is some... You may now understand why I, I, I invited you all because I, there's a lot of like points of inspiration. But one thing that is missing from cultural data analytics, uh, like my, my big dream is to sort of have some kind of systematic science of art and culture. 
But the key sort of generational problem, I think, is to come up with the systematic part. Like, is it, is it even possible to have a systematic science of art and culture in the same way that we find systems biology inactive in things like the broad institute? So that's basically the idea. I just unshare my slides. And uh, so we are all a little bit larger. And so, yeah, I, I'd like to first thank you all very much. And then maybe um, Pascal has raised his hand. So please go ahead. Sure. Well, it was, it, was, it was kind of indecided. So I wasn't sure whether I actually have a question or not. So I was going. <laughs> OK. Um, so when you, when you say you would like a systematic humanities or, or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what what do you mean by that and and you know one 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 fundamental difference that I've thought about before and that occurred to me now also was in biology we have this huge unknown entity right and you know it's it's you know it's interacting with the world out there. There's some influences that come in and that make us sick, or something breaks inside us. We don't know we don't understand how it works, and so we want to understand how it works. But it's a huge black thing that we are trying to probe from the outside. And so my question is, what is it that you want to achieve with this systematics? It's a is it a unified description, or are there unknown mechanisms that you want to uncover regularities laws of cultural production mm -hmm. and that you perhaps even can then use by by observing those in the you know in the current world that is very well documented use this to learn something about prehistoric times that are less well documented where the track record is less less rich and much more sparse but where you can see okay hey, we have a certain pattern that we saw in the 15th century, in the 16th century, and again in the 20th century. We have a similar, and we know the mechanisms that are at stake, that, that are playing out here. Um, and we have a similar, you know, observation, you know, in, I don't know, in, in, in Asian cultural products from 2000 years ago, but we don't know what's going on there. And you can make hypotheses about what cultural events might have, must, can, may have played out there. Mm -hmm. that led to a certain, I don't know, cultural change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think one of the first um, observations of systematicity, which has been made not by me, but by people in the past, but overheard in the main disciplines, is that there is systematic developments going on, such as there is an exponential growth over time going on, Maybe not exponentially, it may fade off with the world population. So there, it may, there seems to be some evidence that there is a coupling mm -hmm. to like sort of the sigmoid that we have going on towards carrying capacity. The same is you find a kind of um, these kind of network structures, which are all over the place. Uh, you find indeed similar trajectories. Like for example, if humans strive for a naturalistic depiction of the human body, uh, this has happened like several times over sort of centuries. And one of the interesting things is people never stop at realistic, but they go towards Baroque. So why does that happen? Similar things happen indeed in uh, China, for example, as in the West, but in China, they happened actually thousands years earlier. So why does this go? Why do we go through similar kind of uh, things? Why do they disappear again? Mm -hmm. that, that is a very interesting question. There is these kind of regularities which are sort of, you know, history has been called an event discipline. It's always different. It cannot be quantified. That's like the state of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And often in contrast to physics, where there's only a few variables, supposedly, there's, now we know there's complexity and we know culture is part of that because we find the same statistic. And, you know, one could say our data, for example, is, is as black as yours because we don't have a lot of information about the past, we don't have a lot of information about the future. In the past, you may even have more information in the genome than you have with cultural artifacts, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But our reconstructions of the future and the past resemble themselves by not having a natural distribution of structure. There is no pink noise in these um, 
uh, distributions of like archaeological reconstructions. They always look clean, just like science fiction movies look clean, even the dirt looks clean. Mm -hmm. While life is more complicated. And so if we really look at the larger amount of data, maybe we can say more about art history than just repeating the same tropes we find in every art history textbook. That's sort of the idea. Mm -hmm. Mila has a nice turn. Well, maybe I raised my, raised my hand a little bit too early because you actually, I was uh, just about kind of like thinking kind of like my, uh, my, my kind of like thinking how, how I find this kind of like um, a systematic approach to culture important. So maybe I'll just repeat basically what, what you said, because, well, my background is in cultural history and, um, and to me, it really seems that we in a way think that we know what is culture, but uh, actually uh, what we know about culture comes from, from certain kinds of like peoples that we know certain kind of like small parts of the culture, but because previously culture has not been, we have not been able to study culture as a kind of like with big data approaches, for instance. So we have never been able to really have it kind of like a self, kind of like a whole or larger larger bunches so so um i think that we also don't know what is culture and what is what is uh, the past as well so uh with these approaches maybe we might be able to do that and also i think that um there is a danger if we if we think that we know what is culture and how it functions, and we don't actually have a systematic approach and, and systematic mm -hmm. analysis of that. As we know that culture, there are kind of like also dangerous cultures, cultural phenomena, you know, uh, we don't know actually, we know that a Brexit happened because of this cultural, uh, you know, Influ influence and and so on. And um, also in my my previous work, I have been studying um the uh, like uh like you know pseudo history or fake historical narratives in uh, russian online media and uh originally i thought that this is kind of like a marginal topic but then i realized that putin uh in and in his speeches he he refers to similar pseudo historical patterns so kind of like it is also very important i think to understand this kind of like how culture works because it affects us all. Yeah. That's how, yeah, how I that's, think. That's, yeah, that's very good. Thank you for that. That was so great. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, it's a little anecdote to illustrate my point. Um, we once, I don't know, for, for some reason, my institute gave Miriam and myself show tickets for a Metallica show here in Vienna. <laughs> And I've been a, a rock fan when I was a teenager, so it was a cool thing. But I recognized that there were 80,000 people in this um, football stadium, and they were, well, Metallica fans. And it made me, you know, think a little bit about what fame is in different, so what actual impact is. The most famous scientist that I know, and with, you know, an, un, an arguably very big impact on, on science, they would get, they would have been, you know, cited 100,000 times or something like this. Metallica does that in two days. You know, so the, the level of reception and of impact that actual culture has is a lot more in some sense than, um, you know, the, the natural sciences have, at least in, in some <laughs> important area. So I'm almost wondering, also, the question the other way around, I find interesting, like, what can we learn from uh, cultural studies? Like, how can we do our science more relevant, more interesting, more essayistic, more intellectual, more humane of sorts? Because I'm not even in, entirely convinced that cultural studies are lacking so much. I'm not even sure what we mean by systematic, you know, does it have more math? Yeah, sure. I don't know, these were just some some first thoughts that I have great admiration for the kind of work that, that you all guys are doing. And I don't, you know, I have my, I have less admiration for the kind of work that we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I, I'd like to make one comment. You know, just the fact that uh, classical music doesn't need anything is not a reason for not having electronic music. I like both. 
And so classical art history, perfectly fine. Classical humanities, perfectly fine. But, you know, they, there is no reason why the humans should say you cannot quantify history if, if it is possible. And it maybe gives you some other insight. Pascal. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, th this helps me to, to understand where you guys are coming from and going and, and how you how you look at things. So it's just my ignorance. I didn't mean to say, okay, yeah, what are you guys doing? It's more like really it was it was a very sincere, honest question. Um, but one thought that I just had in there, um, and it's part what, what you said, Mila, and something that I also thought earlier. Um, can you detect these kind of I don't know, signatures, trends in cultural works before the actual seizure is coming up. You said, I mean, the, the, the speeches of Putin, so you see these kind of things already being reflected. But I'm wondering if you can see these things already, I don't know, if, you know, in the year, in the, in the past 10 years before Brexit, in the cultural works of the UK, if there's, if there's you know, some predictive cultural projections that, that can sometimes be, be discovered or found. And a, a different question that I had, and there was something that you said, um, Max, um, you said there's an exponential development of, of production of, of culture. And at that point, I was wondering, well, does innovation, can that be, be quantified in the sense that, that Henrik Lander talked about? Can that be quantified? And does it also grow exponentially or is it, grow as a I don't know, first derivative of current value, you know, what's the, what's the, the you know, two things that came up <laughs> while you guys were talking and answering my previous question. Yeah, I think that is a fantastic question. That's exactly a question which I think one should be able to ask, right? And so uh, people look at patents, for example, and you can see that the number of patents grows with more population or even faster. So if you follow Geoffrey West in large cities, 50 to 10 times the size, has 12 times as many patents. But most patents are recombinations of older patents, 95% of them indeed, which smells or are similar to what uh, Honor Alexandra was <laughs> talking about. And so there's a really interesting thing. But then the other question is in how much are patents really sort of reflecting true innovation? That's another question. And that's where we have to look at the cultural products inside. Yeah. yeah. And so they're like, I have a little qualitative project going on on the side. It's like a little nugget, like the thing that our laptops have round corners versus edgy corners. You know, supposedly Steve Jobs was uh, sort of inspired by, you know, the design of uh, Dieter Rahm's brown and like all that kind of stuff, right? We have round corners in the 1950s and 60s. But actually, it turns out if you like drill deeply, qualitatively, you find out the exact same discussion is going on since 1850 for the kind of stuff you will carry around as a doctor or as, a, as an architect. You have to carry stuff in a bag, your instruments, and these can either have round corners or edgy corners. And so somebody realizes, oh, round corners are better. You don't hit your bones on it. While then somebody else says, but I want to look different. So they have edgy corners again. So there's all this like, there's innovation on the one side and fashion on the other. And then you have envelopes and shapes and onsets and explosions first. Yeah. So that, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a you know, for lack of a word better word I say it in a derogative manner that's kind of a lame innovation. I'm more thinking yes. about you know I don't know Picasso coming up with a completely new way of drawing faces or um, mm -hmm. you know, or the iPhone which is a complete you know I I don't know maybe maybe it's it's my ignorance that I that I don't see that it's all the same. But I imagine there are some things that are kind of variations on a theme similar to, to Henrik Sandra's protein families she talked about. Mm -hmm. And then there's sometimes something that is that is really novel and, and really innovative. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, that's that's more what I had in mind when I asked it, right? I mean, the first person who invented the wheel and not just, you know, a wheel out of a, you know, out of out of wood instead of instead of, you know, you know what I mean, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of, yes. kind of bigger seizures, you know, something that is fundamentally new and there must be track record in the culture, in, in what you guys are doing, right? You must see these mm -hmm. things. Sometimes something pops up and it's something yes. completely new and it radiates and everybody's like starting to do this. 
Yeah, thank you very much. So these are excellent examples, and they're actually is quite contrary to what the motivation of this uh, conversation is. They are examples. Every single example that comes to my mind, you would see the change quantitatively, but then you have to look qualitatively what actually went on. Like, how did people come up with numbers higher than four? You can actually trace that in a written record. And the people who are best in actually analyzing that are people who can read that kind of script and they do that qualitatively over decades. And, but nevertheless, you can see, like maybe we can see innovations in larger scale, which we wouldn't catch otherwise, and then can do that kind of thing in the same way as sometimes the biologist just needs to go and do qualitative work in vitro. Yeah. Uh, maybe Anna Alexander and then Mila. Thank you. I think uh, what you called qualitative work right now, like this is just drawing a, a, a parallel. So when uh, Pascal and York and I, often we do observation to detect mm -hmm. interesting things from data analysis or systematic experiments, where you have just a lot of information about one or two angles of life. And from there, patterns emerge that sometimes are surprising, sometimes are making sense. But we don't stop there. Like Pascal said, um, like when something is a surprise, it causes a, a hypothesis. And so, a new hypothesis. We don't believe, you'd never believe what you see in a trend. It just makes you think of a better mechanism, new mechanism, but then you need to ask it, is that right? How do I prove it? And that, we call it hypothesis, hypothesis driven work and experiment uh, that can take experimental or computational form that doesn't matter, but it's when you dive down in what's happening. And so I've, I make a parallel to what was just discussed. Whatever the research question is, you observe, you have these big networks. And at the beginning of system biology, that was all we did. <laughs> <laughs> but like, there's definitely like a lot less value if you don't do that second step. And here you said, oh, qualitative work. But in my view, it could be that it's it qualitative or not. Mm -hmm. Like it can be different approach, but it's like from the trends mm -hmm. to the true understanding, need to test hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Thank, thank you very much. This is this is great. Actually, uh, all three of us sort of like were in Boston at the time when Uri Alon gave his like sort of like you know uh, cloud of uncertainty uh, pitches, and I remember in one of these talks he sort of said there was this moment in his lab when he got stuck. And so their idea was to sort of print out the network very large. And, you know, it's like, you know, rationally speaking, you could say this BS. But they just had this large network on the table. And they're staring at it for days in different ways. At some point, they found something. And that became the famous network motives paper, which was pretty fundamental. And so that kind of thing is sort of something which is exactly the kind of uh, thing that needs to happen. But I think both stages are necessary. And now there's one irony. This is sort of maybe why I, I said like this can also happen qualitative. The moment once you have a picture and you stare at it and interpret it and do so in different ways, you can use your measurement instruments, you can quantify it, you can use your own eyes. It's fundamentally the same staring as a network picture or as a scatter plot. Then an art historian looking at a painting. It's a very similar process. It's critical aesthetic. And like, like not see how beautiful it is, whatever, but trying to understand how does this work? How is this made? What went into it and stuff like that? And I think that is sort of a, a really interesting thing that in some sense we all do. And this is obviously a difficult step because it's easy to imagine and say, oh, I do a network picture of my data. But once you've got the network picture, that's where the really hard work begins. And so if you're not stuck at that point, then probably it's not a new project. So this is like sort of a really interesting thing which also necessitates this multidisciplinarity to get over it, because typically we're good at one thing, but not good at all things. And then to solve that, we need to sort of like the crowd, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Can I ask an unrelated question since I have the open mic? You, you said something, I, I'm absolutely unaware of it. You talked uh -huh. about it. You said that in 1923 or 29. Yeah. 
field was told no to quantitative analysis. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so qualitative analysis. So yes, so uh, like my art history is uh, like literally the database I analyzed in my PhD was about monument documentation. It was started in 1947 at a point in time that people said, let's actually count the actual recognizable Roman sculptures in drawings. And it was a reaction to a sort of less systematic data collection called the Memnusune Atlas by Abby Barburg, who was the heir of the Barburg Bank. Also the sort of collector of one of the largest art libraries in the world still in existence. And so he worked with a person called Ernst Kassir, who's also the guy who was discussing, you heard like this uh, in a situation right now, who is the famous Davos discussion between the philosophers, Heidegger and Kassir, where Heidegger went skiing and Kassir did not um, at that particular day. So Kassir has this idea that you can act soft space, meaning space, is actually purely mathematical. So you have some kind of transformation going on from the real world, Euclidean space, whatever you want to call it, through our sensory apparatus into some kind of cognitive representation, which he basically, and this is like what he means with that, was in some sense topological, continuous or metric, so not a, a metric or non-metric discrete or continues a completely different question. But sort of they had this idea and spun that, and you can very clearly follow in art history, the people around them, they, they, it's not that they didn't understand, they didn't want to. And the people who are close to this sort of, oh, there is this resonance between natural science, computation, and sort of cultural studies, that chance sort of was lost once. And I think right now it's sort of like coming back at us, right? So people can still disagree with what I'm saying right now in an art history department. The moment they work with machine learning embedded images where, machine, where images are embedded in a multidimensional metric space and something is done for them that is actually soothing their demands, they basically enact something which is related to this notion of Ernst Kassir, which is very close to also the birth of computation and stuff like that. So this is a really interesting sort of, there's a common route that actually goes back all the way to Leibniz. I've read a book chapter about this, but um, so it's, it's sort of, you know, it's almost a fight you don't want to fight because it's much more easy to say, look, this kind of methods are used, they do work, we can use them. And but obviously we need to find out how good they are in working and stuff like that. So that's the idea. Thank, Thank you for that. Much. That's, that's really interesting and also parallel to biology, like the early days of computational and systems biology, where mm -hmm. faith like faced a lot of rejection. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and um you know it, it, it th there's also a whole history of the quantitative science and interaction with biology and who adopted it and when and how and why. But now it's yeah. everywhere. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I tell, but the interesting thing is, at the same time, the phenomenon is everywhere. But there is also these people knew each other, like you know the the epigenetics guy, Warrington. He knew the Bauhaus artists, and so there, there is like this sort of the, there is a fan club of Wentworth Thompson, who himself was uh, in the fan club of Goethe, who was an aesthetician. And if you read the morphology of the ponds, there is like three, four words, all excuses for why he took so long and stuff like that. So there is a kind of concoction where studying nature, studying culture was much closer together traditionally since 1580. And it sort of increasingly bifurcated. And I think it could actually benefit from like doing both. That's like sort of the idea. Mila. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, going back to Pascal's uh, comment or, or question um, regarding the signatures or trends that would allow us to kind of like foresee in a way uh, what is what is going to happen in culture. I I think this is uh, this is super interesting and and you know one of the reasons why I exactly why, why I think this is it's super interesting um, to to study this and. Um, but I, I don't know yet whether that's actually possible or not. Um, maybe, well, some of my my colleagues, they, you know, they might already kind of like know how, what they are doing. And, and uh, but um, I have sometimes difficulties in kind of like understanding what are the meaningful units of analysis in culture, which ones we 
which are kind of like meaningful for for follow. Uh, for instance, in my own research, I'm particularly interested in circulation and uh, kind of like development of knowledge uh, <clears throat> in different forms. And sometimes it is very hard for me to kind of like really uh, kind of like put my finger on on those units that actually make knowledge, for instance, in text, is it kind of like a text snippet or is it the idea behind the text? Or if I'm looking at the newsreels, is it kind of like within uh, visual images or or certain colors or objects? Or is it a you know, summary of all of these? So, um, well, so this is kind of like still my my kind of like ongoing problem, and I, I I'm actually not sure that I will be ever able to to fully um, solve this. And probably it's kind of like combination of all these, as you all of you have have uh, showed in your your studies. So this actually leads uh, to my question to you. Then is kind of like how do you is it easy for you to kind of like determine what are kind of like the units that you are analyzing? Uh, or is there a th certain kind of like discussion going on? Which which are the actual elements to be studied uh, in your field? Yeah, I would like to, to take this one because this is also a question that uh, really I have thought a lot about ever, you know, for many, many, many years. And that is one of the questions on which I have collaborated with philosophers and rhetoric scholars to help, basically to help me think about it. And like, if you think of culture as a system, a human system in space and time, just like we think of cells and organisms as systems that are also dynamic in space and time. In fact, like, I've come to the conclusion that so since everything is related, but not but everything is related at different levels. And some aspects are more constant, some are more plastics, some underlie and explain other aspects, whereas some are more emergent properties that cannot be easily explained. And so I've concluded that there is not a relevant uh, unit because the different aspects can all be conceptualized and they all change in time and space. And so depending on what is the question that I, you're interested in, you can tackle one or another or both levels of information. And I think the, 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 this is actually the strength of this systems thinking is to, is to not limit, is to, is to, to be very aware that everything's connected in ways that also have like hierarchical um, relationships, but also et hierarchical uh, horizontal relationships. And that we, we, if we want to understand the system, you got to ask questions through different lenses at different scales. An example in biology, like I said, those little uh, protogenes change all the time. The nucleotides of the genome change even more. Aspects such as the expression of ancestral genes changes as well, but less. Aspects such as phenotypes, some are very, like traits, some are very, very constrained. Some change differently. So what, deep and fast. And so even on the scale of seasons, so all the, basically, I don't know, all, all these different interconnections and how they change in time to me, like you, you can peek at it with different ways. And some of them are mechanistic and some of them are more descriptive, if that makes sense. All right, for me. Um, I think I think the question your question Vida, goes back to what what uh, Anne said the moment before or the, the, the turn before that 
Yes, many things may matter. And, and then it becomes a question. You cannot look at everything at the same time. So it becomes, essentially it becomes a hypothesis, right? And so then the question is really inside your gut feeling, what do you think could be an important, an important, you know, where could you see a signal? Um, you know, from, I don't know, from the news process and, and, you know, from our understanding of, you know, how, I don't know, maybe even how we express ourselves, where could we perhaps see a signal of, you know, something changing on a societal level? So on the one hand, there's analytics, and, and I think we've seen a lot of that, so you, you analyze everything, but at one point it becomes a question of, of, of it's so so oh God. What what Anne said earlier was, you know, indeed in the early days we, you know, we kind of analyzed data and we would generate a plot, and there was an answer of the yeast cell cycle, and it was all beautiful and it all seemed to be there. And then later we realized, oh, it's actually much more, much more difficult. And there are some things that jump out at you, but more sophisticated answers require more sophisticated questions and more sophisticated hypotheses. And that's I think that's in the end that's that's what makes you know science and good science to really decide okay what is a good hypothesis what is my gut feeling where do I want to look because you cannot look at everything at the same time and I, you know I, I guess that would be my answer yes everything does matter but since you cannot look everywhere at, at, at all the time you need to set priorities and that's where the art of science begins. <laughs> And you, and you don't also have to look at everything all the time. I mean, there are aggregate phenomena that are well described by aggregate atoms, right? Like you don't need to study quantum mechanics to understand chemistry and you don't really need to do very detailed chemistry to understand phenomena that happen on a, on a higher level of organization. And I guess in a, or it appears from, from what you're saying that the the field of cultural data science perhaps cannot you know get back to well defined quantities such as chemistry physics and and biology but that could be perhaps a cool question in itself right to to mm -hmm. first list what are relevant players and to figure out what are relevant phenomena that can be associated to these players at that level of of aggregation mm -hmm. I would like to show two images which um, show you a little bit the state of where we are. Um, so <clears throat> what you see here is a number of transformations of the image in the upper left, which is a windmill by Piet Mondrian. And each one of these um, is sort of some standard image magic transformation of the image. And um, you can see in the upper right, there's a number C, which is the compression ratio after the transformation where you uh, divide the compression of the transformation to, uh, by the compression of the original. And if you do that, you get this UMAP picture um, that I've shown in the beginning. Uh, but now if you look at this picture, here we take the two-dimensional UMAP dimensionality reduction, make a heat map out of it, and every one of the pictures on the right is a distribution of the median or average um, compression ratio value of a particular transformation. And one of the interesting things here is they all look different. So the key thing is like the polymorphic similarity as um, or po polymorphic family resemblance as Rudolf Wittgenstein would call this when he describes Chef versus Tucker. Or when you look at a poodle and you think, oh, that's a dog, not a cat. Like the kind of stuff where it's really hard to break it down into categories. This sort of like polymorphic similarity. This is captured quantitatively by exactly this. And your transformation does not do not necessarily have to be the same as my transformation. Very similar to in the microbiome, my species may be very different from Anna Alexandra's species uh, because you know I don't have a that awesome tie around the corner of my university. So basically, but still the function would be the same. And that is, I think, a really interesting thing. Maybe the function is a little different, maybe it's the same. That is an interesting subject of discussion. But we're increasingly getting into this 
um, phenomena. We saw example with networks, as uh, Pascal has shown today. Here is an, uh, an interesting example with images. Uh, one could also mention the uh, representation of memories in the brain, which there is one school of thought who thinks it's time encoded. It's not neural encoded. So again, not discrete, but there is these things that come and go. So that is sort of like a kind of summary where there is systematicity. And bye-bye, Pascal. <laughs> so you have to leave early. So yeah, I think that is a, there's, there's some resonance. We're obviously not doing the same thing. There is not the same thing panning out for cultural studies than there is panning out for biology. Maybe at some point we may be a part of a larger kind of systematic information studies of life and culture and whatsoever. But I think there is hopefully a basis for conversation in the future, which I would love to continue. Yes, Alexander. Yeah, actually, Max, so like what you, ex you exactly showed using different methods really echoes the problem of uh, systematics in biology as it comes to, um, to classifying species and their relationships. Mm -hmm. So this is a problem that has existed since, you know, Linnaeus, like very, very old relative. And so you take species and depending on how you describe them, you end up classifying them in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you can take like how species reproduce and make a tree where yes. close, the, like they are more similar, so they must be closer. And then you take how species develop, like what's the first type of cell division, you get a different order. What, how close are their genes? Depending on what genes you pick, you, you get a different order. So depending on what criteria mm -hmm. we use to look at the world of species and biology, uh, you basically reconstruct an entirely different set of relationships that tends to be uh, interpreted as history. Mm -hmm. and, but this cannot be true. Yes. But there can only be one history. <laughs> and uh, of, you know, and so it's actually like it's like a, a totally ongoing issue, but very, very parallel. Like how to reconcile discordant trees in this case, but how to, you know, how and why and how do we understand the, these different relationships? And that's, I, I mean, it's, um, I don't know, I invite, I invite you to look a bit uh, about this because it's, both systematic approaches, but also very much uh, what we were describing before, of like hypothesis testing and uh, reconciliation yes. statistics and a lot of different things too. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I thank you very much for, 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 for pointing it out. And so there's indeed, a, there's one difference in biology. In biology, you can take different gene phylogenies of different genes say in the same species. And then you may end up with a phylogeny of birds, which is sort of the consensus tree, some average tree over many, many trees. But typically in art history, we are lucky if we have one tree. <laughs> and the tree is typically descriptive, not a phylogeny, but it's sort of like some similarity uh, relationships. And so that makes it a little harder. So, but one interesting thing, there's one commonality, which is this thing in time. And so I think we're, we're thrown back onto something that smells utterly more like paleontology, like the stratigraphy of things. And then we have maybe a closer look at like how these interrelationships are. And one thing that is different from the past, maybe, we don't need to sort of fall back into the fusionist approaches. Like, you know, does life out of Africa go to Europe and then Asia or Asia then Europe or whatever? It's like maybe both. There's two people that can walk both ways. And so there's this kind of things where maybe not only the data, we need to recognize that the data is more complicated, but we also need to recognize that the explanation could be more complicated, like what is actually panning out. I think that is really, really interesting. And I think there is some kind of two-way street. The fact that biologists always draw binary trees, while in culture, we almost never find binary trees, is an interesting thing. Culture is, a, you know, everything is horizontal mean terms, basically. There is no such thing as a kind of split or something like that. And so that is, I think, a lot of like things that where people like us could talk in the same room about what we're doing and maybe maybe make some progress in both directions. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. Yeah. And I think uh, 
the well, the history part is, I guess, like my obsession <laughs> because of evolution. But like where where it's like powerful is so because you showed us basically you maps like that. These are similarity plots, right? Yeah. And then depending on like the different colors you are showing us, or well, actually when depending on what characteristic we look at, we see different clusters, different groups that are more similar in one axis and more different mm -hmm. in another axis. And that's more what I was referring to, that that's a problem in biology as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's true in evolution for species, that is true when we compare molecular profiles of cell types. That So, so there are approaches to think about that that are yes. not final. And that's what I, I guess that's what I was getting at, like that's maybe another space Yes. where you can perhaps find some inspiration, methodological inspiration as well. Yes, thank you very much. We are out of time, but Jörg, you want to have one last? Oh, it's just uh, whenever no, no, anybody of you says something, I want to have 10 other thoughts, but um, it must come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> we can go on, but the recording will be stopped. <laughs> so, yeah. We have uh, another uh, Open Lab seminar coming up. Um, and uh, let me take a look because um, do we have another one? No, there is no only one, which is um, on December 12th in seven days, there will be Alain Chu, who uh, is a ERC Advanced Grant holder in cognitive science, but she's also a pianist. And so it's about at the heart of music from perception to physiology analytics, like the correlation of um, heartbeat and certain types of music, for example. And um, I'm very much looking forward to that. This will happen in person with the piano. So see you all next week. Thank you very much.